So as we've heard in various presentations uh, today already, the organization of the uh, connectivity of the brain at a macroscopic scale is heterogeneous uh, and quite challenging to analyze, uh, quite complex. Likewise, as we've just been reminded by the previous presentation, the organization at a microscopic scale, area intrinsic scale, is also quite complicated, uh, very challenging to analyze. So to bring the two together into a generic model of uh, multi-scale cortical organization appears very challenging indeed, if not impossible, unless there are some rules that link the two levels systematically. And so, like Srikant and, and uh, the people he's working with, we're looking for rules that can connect different levels of cortical organization. And that's what I would like to talk about in the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, I will outline two of such principles uh, that may help to uh, explain the connection, uh, apply them to a number of data sets uh, from different cortical, uh, cortical organizational types, as well as species, and then finally um, give a first glimpse of how the two scales may be connected. In our work, we're coming from a more um, top-down perspective as compared to the, to the blue brain approach, but likewise, we're looking for principles. So in that, that um, sense, we're actually quite similar in the spirit. So the kind of features that we're interested in are very simple ones. There have been a number of analyses in recent years that look at complex aspects of network topology, uh, network organization, and help try to link them to, to other levels of brain organization. We're interested in the most basic features of connectivity, such as the existence of specific pathways or the absence of specific pathways between uh, pairs of regions, as well as their density. And we're also interested in uh, constraining the characteristic patterns of laminar origin and termination in the cortex. So this is the, the very essential features. They're, they're really fundamental for any kind of modeling, and this is what we would like to explain. So let me start by uh, saying a few words about wiring principles. The first and probably the most intuitive one is wiring minimization or constraining of connectivity by distance. And this is very intuitive as the brain is a physically embedded object, so it makes sense that the wiring should be reduced, also taking inspiration from technical examples, such as the wiring of, of microcircuits, which uh, have inspired some of our beloved system neuroscience diagrams. And indeed, there's some evidence for uh, apparent wiring minimization in the brain. Uh, however, it's also uh, known that if you look at the actual distributions of projections, there's no strict wiring minimization. So many of the projections are among neighbors in the cortex, but there's also a long tail of uh, quite distant um, projections. And there are a number of counterexamples. So the fact that the optic pathways span almost the entire diameter of the brain, and they're projecting back from the uh, very back to the front, uh, the thalamic nuclei, which are next to each other but unconnected, and so on, they argue against the strict wiring minimization principle. Uh, and indeed, if you compare directly uh, the uh, wiring minimization uh, of the, the actual uh, brain connectivity, both at the systems level or of C. elegans, to the, to the po theoretically possible minimum or the maximum, you see that it's not quite near the minimum. However, some uh, other organizational features, such as the, the, the average shortest path links, are actually quite close to the theoretical pos theoretically possible minimum. Uh, this would be the maximum again. So uh, wiring minimization may not be the full story. Uh, another uh, traditional concept that may help to explain connections is the organization of the brain into gradients of uh, evolutionary uh, development, of ontogenetic development and uh, gene expression patterns, as well as cytoarchitectonic gradients that follow from the uh, combination of those two. And uh, it's quite a traditional hypothesis that these cytoarchitectonic gradients also shape connectivity, so that areas that are more similar in the architecture are more frequently and more strongly connected. And there's particularly strong evidence coming from the work of uh, Helen Barber's intergroup over the, the, the last three decades or so, that the differences in architecture between different cortical regions, as shown here on the x-axis, help to shape the relative distribution of projections in the cortical layers, so both the termination patterns as well as the origin patterns. So these are the, the central hypotheses that we started with. There are also a number of other hypotheses, so it's been suggested that similarities in cortical thickness, for instance, may correspond to structural connectivity, and you can think of a number of other uh, constraints, and we've tried to explore some of the, the, the basic structural parameters that may be relevant in this context, but mostly the cytoarchitectonic hypothesis as well as the distance hypothesis. And we've done so for a number of species wherever connectivity data sets were available, uh, including the uh, classic work of Fellman and Van Essen on the uh, macaque visual cortical system, 
uh, a more recent update of the uh, macaque connectome by the group of Henry Kennedy, as well as traditional cat cortical connectomes and uh, more recently available human connectome data from the HCP. As I said, we are focusing on distance and cytokine tonic similarity, and uh, in the absence of uh, true information on the length of projections in the brain, we operationalize distance uh, very pragmatically by the border distance, that is the number of borders you have to cross to get from one area to another cortical area, or to the Euclidean distance between the mass centers of cortical areas where this information was available. And we quantified cytokine tonic similarity in two different ways. Uh, starting with the, the general parameter of a type difference between the, the origin of a projection and the termination of a projection, and defining the architectonic type of an area by the apparent density and prominence of the different cortical layers. So this would be a high type area. Think of something like area 17, where you have um, many very dense cellular layers and a pronounced uh, granular layer, uh, layer 4. Uh, and this would be a low type area, limbic areas, uh, such as orbitofrontal uh, uh, cortex, where you can't really discriminate uh, more than, than three or so cortical layers, two and three together and five and six. Overall density is much reduced. Density of neurons in the cortical layers is also much reduced. So this is the, in this way we defined eight uh, cortical types for the macaque monkey and five for the cat, uh, based on an ordinal type definition. And wherever available, we also used uh, a, a simplified uh, metric measure, the neuronal density across the all cortical layers in order to just take the density difference as an indicator of the overall architectonic similarity of cortical areas. So let's get started and let's just see how these um, parameters play out for actual connectivity data of the classical Fellerman and Vanessen data set. So as was to be expected, there are many connections among neighboring areas, here shown existing connections in black uh, bars and, and absent connections in white bars. But there's also this long tail of uh, projections that go over six, seven, or uh, eight cortical borders uh, all across the system. And if you put um, uh, everything on a, a relative scale so that you look at the number of projections that exist uh, for potentially existing connections across a certain length. So all of the connections that could exist at, just, let's say, border distance 8 and see how many of them actually exist, you will find uh, that distance is not really a very good predictor of connectivity as it goes down first and then actually goes up again. So you have almost all, half of the, the, the connections that could exist at length 8 or 7 or so actually present in the system. By contrast, if you look at the type similarity of cortical areas, uh, you find that connections mostly run between areas that are very similar in their architectonic organization and almost entirely absent between areas that are very different in their architecture. Taking the additional measure of um, thickness similarity, there's a very heterogeneous picture here. Maybe that areas that are very different in their thickness uh, don't really form projections among each other. Looking at the rank correlations of the individual data points, we see that indeed the, the correlation with the structure similarity is greatest. There also appears to be some correlation with the thickness similarity. However, this goes away if you do partial correlations and account actually for the type of these areas. Then it's reduced to zero. There's also a nice relationship in that uh, the most similar areas form the densest connections, although the overall correlations here are reduced. Uh, and that's a general observation. Let's look at the laminar profiles of projections. So it's been known for quite some time that there are characteristic patterns of origin and termination of projections in the cortical layers. So it was found that for projections from areas 17 to 18, 18 to 19, and 19 to 20, so projecting from a, a peripheral caudal to a rostral uh, direction, the projections originated predominantly in the upper cortical layers, terminating in layer 4 or the deep cortical layers, and they were reciprocated by projections from deep cortical layers going back to the uh, boundary of, of layer 2 and layer 1. So based on this observation uh, from, from um, classical work of Rockland and Panya, um, then all such projection patterns in the brain were classified as forward or feed forward or backward projection patterns or feedback projection patterns. And that's a very, very regular cortical motif, one of the most regular aspects of cortical organization indeed. So taking such patterns and plotting them against the uh, structural parameters that we're interested in, uh, such as border distance or thickness similarity, we don't really find any correlation. So I'm, I'm not showing any more pictures on them because th there's not really any good uh, relation with these two aspects. But if you plot, for instance, uh, the laminar characteristics, forward and backward pathways, uh, against type difference, you find that projections from higher type areas, so more cortical layers, higher neuronal density, to lower type areas, uh, form forward projections, as shown here in red, 
and projections from lower type areas, so more limbic areas, less density, fewer cortical layers, to higher areas from four, uh, backward projections shown here in blue. And the highest proportion of lateral pathways, but um, uh, of, of a more bile, uh, bilaminar balanced uh, projection patterns shown here in yellow are actually formed between areas that are very similar in the organization. The same thing can be uh, seen if you uh, operationalize the architectonic similarity with the density difference between the areas. So this is neuronal density differences of the two cortices that you're interested in. Forward projections are associated with projections from denser areas to less dense areas, feedback uh, from uh, less dense areas to denser areas, and um, um, projections with a lateral component uh, exist predominantly between areas that are very similar in the neuronal density. Uh, once again, if you do rank correlations of all the parameters, you find that the correlations are highest, most significant for the uh, type differences and the density differences, uh, and, and much reduced and not significant uh, uh, overall for the uh, distance and the thickness similarity of the areas. So based on these observations, uh, we've arranged cortical areas in this uh, so-called structural model, where uh, the areas are placed based on their uh, uh, architectonic type. So the highest type areas are on the outside of this ring. So V1 uh, is up there, V2, and so on. And then you're moving to lower type areas, which are more at the center of the organization. And this arrangement actually coincides with the topological uh, arrangement of areas in the brain. So you have areas of the, of the sensory, more to periphery, more to the outside of this diagram, and areas that are more on the inside of the brain, as, as most people would feel intuitively, actually also on the inside of this diagram. Connections are color-coded in such a way that uh, connections between areas of the same type or adjacent types are shown in uh, black, two types difference in blue, and more than two types different in red. And the predominance of the, the black and the blue connections really demonstrates the overall consistency of this kind of model. Connectivity here is, is identical to Fellum and Vanessen in the, in the classical diagram. So we sought to uh, validate uh, these findings across a number of other data sets that are available, both for the macaque as well as for uh, other species. Uh, and so looking at the uh, recent, uh, recently published uh, connectome uh, from the Kennedy lab, uh, here again are the correlations with the similarity of areas in their density on the log scale. That's a perfect correlation, in fact. And a near to perfect correlation uh, there was also found for the uh, distance of projections. Uh, we analyzed uh, these two factors, in fact, the three factors of the thickness similarity was also included in a multivariate uh, predictive model using uh, SVM uh, and found the highest uh, um, predictive uh, loading for the density difference of the areas, much higher than of the other individual factors. If you combine the factors, then the best performance was actually achieved by uh, combining the density and the distance difference. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, you find that for areas that are very similar in their density, and uh, nearby, you have a posterior probability of the prediction of 85%. Uh, That's just what's this line uh, representing here. Uh, this line up here represents 15% of chance of existing of a projection. Then we used uh, tenfold validation prediction in order to see how well um, using these thresholds and the, the posterior probabilities, we could actually predict the connectivity from the model. Uh, and at that level, we achieve a very high accuracy of the prediction indeed. So just combining the uh, architectonic similarity in terms of density and the, uh, the distance information allows you to, to reproduce uh, the, the uh, connectivity of the system almost perfectly. <coughs> uh, we made another interesting observation in that uh, hub areas or core areas uh, in the brain turn out to have much lower density uh, than non-core areas. And this is a general phenomenon whereby areas of low neuronal density have more projections than area of a higher neuronal uh, density. <coughs> and finally, we looked at the connectivity information uh, published in a companion paper by the Kennedy Group. And indeed, there was a very good uh, correlation between the uh, origin patterns and the density differences of the areas, uh, and no other relationships existed. There seemed to be one for the density <laughs> difference, but that again went away if controlled for the density difference. So very, very briefly, uh, similar, almost identical results were found in a cat connectome based on the um, somewhat age data of uh, Scanner et al. Uh, so perfect rank correlations with uh, distance and uh, type difference. Uh, once again, uh, high predictive values, uh, somewhat higher for the uh, type difference than for the, for the distance in a predictive model, which allowed to make uh, quite a number of predictions with high reliability, also for pathways that have not been <laughs> tested yet. Uh, 
once again, we found a difference between the HAPS areas, which generally have a lower type, and the non hub areas, which have a higher type. And that's the expression of a general relationship where higher type areas, so more layers, higher neuronal density, have fewer connections than the more limbic areas in the brain. <coughs> Uh, and finally, uh, we saw that projections from higher type areas to lower type areas tend to form ascending or forward pathways, whereas uh, feedback pathways or descending pathways are formed by projections from lower type areas to higher type areas. So almost identical results to the ones in the monkey. Uh, more recently, we used the, uh, the Allen data and the, the ZingLab data um, because they also offer a nice chance to look at IPSI and contralateral connectivity patterns. Uh, and in an analysis of these data, Alex Gulas, who's here, uh, found that once again, uh, distance and cytoarchitecture um, predict significantly uh, the uh, existence of projections, somewhat more strongly for the ipsi lateral projections, uh, whereas for the contralateral projections, it's more the cytoarchitectural differences uh, that allow the prediction of the projections. So there's a, there's a large body of evidence now. Uh, that the structural model, structural similarities uh, explaining connectional features works uh, for a number of cortices in the non-human primate as well as across species. Uh, and um, there's a very nice poster still up today uh, by Alex Gulas that uses these regularities of cortical organization for cross-species predictions. So training a predictor in one species in order to predict connectional features in another species in order to demonstrate the universality of the principle. And it works just beautifully. So I would encourage you to see this poster over there at the hall. But the question that you may be interested in to, to know is whether this also works for the human brain. And for the human brain, uh, by now, we have some connectional information, for instance, for the works of the Human Connectome Project. But what we're lacking as yet is detailed uh, uh, architectonic information. Uh, and uh, until the, uh, the, the work of Markus Axe and, and other people in Ulich, for instance, with the Big Brain Project and Evans also, uh, produces much more uh, quantitative and detailed information. But for the moment, the most detailed uh, comprehensive information about the human brain is actually found in the classical work of uh, von Economo and, and Koskinas. Uh, and fortunately, it's all quantitative. So if you transform this information into MNI space, which uh, several people have done by now, Martin van den Hervel, and, and we've also made some efforts, you can actually use all the quantitative information associated with this classical work uh, and use it in predictive uh, connectomics. And what you will find there, so this is just a, a demonstration to show the, the, the connectome data uh, and the architectonic information that's from Fonicomo transferred into, into standard space uh, and, and, and done into a standard parcellation. Uh, you can analyze this, uh, and uh, this will result in a very busy diagram, uh, I'm afraid. But what it shows is that the similarity, architectonic similarity, particularly of the upper cortical layers, indeed is uh, significantly correlated with the existence, absence of projections. So in fact is the distance, but this is a factor uh, that is intrinsic to the uh, diffusion-based co uh, connectivity data. And so it's very difficult to deconvolve that from the actual information of how much distance predicts from, from, from the methodological information. And this is true both for the right hemisphere as well as for the left hemisphere. Very early days, uh, so we, we, this needs to be confirmed in other data sets. So what I've tried to convince you of is that the architectonic similarity of cortical areas is consistently correlated with the presence and absence of pathways, as well as the laminar patterns of uh, origin and uh, terminations. And less consistent relations are indeed seen for the distance or thickness similarity. Uh, and we've observed similar relationships uh, across different cortices and different species, macaque, mouse, and there are also some early results that don't um, contradict us completely for the human brain. How does this now uh, allow an integration of the, this the last, uh, last figure, in fact, uh, well, last but one, uh, <laughs> integration of the, the, the micro and the macro scale. So just to, to remind you of what the scheme looks like, similar cortices are connected by bilateral origin patterns, quite frequently connected, quite densely connected, whereas dissimilar cortices uh, have unilateral projection patterns of a more forward and, and backward nature. Uh, and so if you take in the additional reflection that the intrinsic connectivity also varies by cortical location, uh, so, for instance, this is a more canonical circuit of sensory areas, um, and the, the work of the blue brain is also based on, on, on something that's more similar to that. But limbic areas have a different intrinsic structure. You can use the extrinsic connectivity rules to connect uh, more limbic areas in such a fashion and more eulaminate areas in such a fashion and areas of different type in such a fashion. Okay, ending on this one. So I hope that this is a starting ground for bringing in ever more 
uh, detailed information on the different scales, on the macro scale as well as the micro scale, in order to build even more detailed models of generic cortical connectivity that then can also be fed into computational models uh, that take these rules into account. And some initial uh, version of this work has already found its way into uh, the, the work of the group of Markus Diesmann, the supercomputational model of the macaque primate cortex in collaboration with Sasha van Albada and Rembrandt Bakker. Thank you very much and sorry for running over a little bit. <laughs>